what God has done through their life. Pay their school, food. I don't have to pay anything, amen? Yeah. Yeah. This goes for free. That's, that's who we serve in. We serve in the God that he worked to create blessing in your life. That whatever that you're struggling with, he will pay it off. Whatever that you need, he will provide. So, uh, yeah, Junior, would you come up? So, but what's happening here is that this is only recorded in John, in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, which talk about who Jesus is. They don't have this. And John was in Jesus' inner circle, so he heard of things that were only those who were close to Jesus could hear. And so here's, here's what's happening here. We're seeing a picture of Jesus, the Son, and the Father, the Trinity, the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. We're seeing a picture between the Son and the Father in their communion, uh, communion between each other. The way they talk to each other. So it's like a little snapshot. So Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But in the Trinity, we see how the Son and the Father how they commune and connect to each other. And this is like very special. This is a crazy prayer. It's a very special, particular prayer in which the Son communicates with his Father. And so we're going to look on to John chapter 17, verse 4. He just finished preaching. Um, uh, he just finished preaching to the, um, his disciples, and they just had the Passover. He just washed their feet, and so Peter already. This is after Peter denied Jesus. After Peter said, "Jesus is going to die with you," and Jesus said, "No, you can deny, deny me three times." And then this is also after uh, Judas went ahead and going to uh, go and betray Jesus. So all of these things are happening. The Passover already happened. He already washed their feet. And so Jesus comes and he talks to all of these disciples from 13 to, uh, 13 to 16. And, and in this, he talks about how like he's going to die. He's confident because their disciples and their master is going to die. Imagine your father going to die. Imagine your parent going to die. That's how like, that's how like strong this is. Imagine your father is telling you, I'm gonna die son, I'm gonna die daughter. I'm going to go on the cross. I'm going to die tomorrow. But I want you to know this. What type of words can your father say to you to comfort you that he's going to die? And this is Jesus. And Jesus is saying words. He's trying to comfort his disciples. And he's trying to talk to them and motivate them. He's giving them a pep speech about what's really going to happen. And he's going to get crucified right after the book of chapter 17. So uh, if you look at 17 verse 1. And do we have verse 2 to 5 back there? That's all I need. Verse 1 to 5 is all I need right now. So uh, let's go from verse 1. This is, this is what happens. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. This, this is what he's saying. My death has come. The reason why I came in this world, that excruciating death, the cross, the hour has come. To go, so glorify your son. That the Son may glorify you. Can you go to the next verse? Verse 2. Since you have given him authority over all flesh. So this is what Jesus came to do. He has given all, he's been given authority over all flesh, all mankind, to give eternal life to all who he has given him. And this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, who we have sent. 
verse 4, I'm glorified you on earth and accomplished the work that you called me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I have with you before the world exists. So let's pray. Lord, I pray, Lord, that your spirit of God will fall upon our hearts, that we may see you as I, that we may know you as a Savior. And I pray, Lord, that our church today, Lord, that would have the eyes of our heart and lights on us, would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation. There's no one else that owes the Father except you, Jesus, and you choose to whom you will give the Father. So, Lord, in your will, Lord, let us see more of the Father. Let us know him. Let us see in your word, by your spirit, the deep the thoughts of God, the riches of God, and how it relates to one I pray, Lord, for no anxiety or any burden that I have upon myself when you preach this, but only in your words. Your words will come out. In your name we pray. Amen. So if we look at John chapter 17, verse 2, uh, this is what Jesus came to do, right? So he, since you have given him authority over all flesh, and you're given, that's the purpose of why he's here, is to be the king of everyone, a lord of mankind, to be the king of the people, and to give eternal life. So this is what he came to do. This is what all his works were for. He came on this earth so that he could give us eternal life. And, and, and we already know that. It's like basic Christian, Christian foundations of, of why you're Christians. He just came down to save you. You know the word, you know the name Jesus, what that means? The name Jesus means God saves. Yeshua, God saves. That's his purpose. He came down to save us from eternal death, to give us eternal life. That's what he came, that's what his works were for. And what's interesting is that Jesus explains what's eternal life. So if Jesus' main work was to come here and bring us eternal life, which is the kingdom, which is the life, the new life, an everlasting life. Verse 3 goes on to explain what is eternal life? What is that? Is it just going to heaven? Is it just going to heaven and never dying? Is, what's eternal life? What's that all about? Is it just being immortal? And so this is what Jesus says. This is eternal life. Verse 3. That they know you. So last, I preached from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16, the last time I came up here. And that says that God will give the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And all throughout the New Testament, all throughout the New Testament, we see these words of knowledge of him, knowing him, Knowing his love, knowledge of the glory of God, knowing, knowing, knowing. And the whole New Testament is just dabbled in knowing God. Those words, knowledge and knowing. And there's two words, for, there's two words for knowledge and knowing in the, Bible, in the Bible. In the Greek, knowledge. Knowledge is epi, 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 epi gnosis. And that means, that means the noun knowledge. And that's like a that's like to know. It's, it, it's just knowledge. It's, it's to know, but when you say something is knowledge, when you say it's a noun, it's epignosis. And then you have the verb in Greek, which is to know, and that's gnosko. So both of those are to explain what knowing is. But the question is, is what is knowing? What does it mean to know? And so you know, spoken, which is a verb, and then the knowledge of Christ, uh, the knowledge, which is a noun, um, which is epignosis. They're both meant to know. They're both meant to mean this type of knowing in the sense of not just factual knowing, but an experiential learning, but an experience. So when Jesus says this is eternal life, he's not talking to the Pharisees. So here's what knowledge is not. Think about this. This is what knowledge is not. There's a way to know God that does not bring eternal life. And this is it. There's a verse in the Bible that says the demons shudder and they believe God. If you think about the demonic kingdom, they know God. 
You know what? More than any scholar or any Pharisee at that time. And yet, they don't get into heaven. And yet, they'll get eternal life. They have a knowledge of God that doesn't bring them eternal life. And Jesus on the last day will say to some of you, get away from me, I never knew you. But some of them on that day will be like, well, I preached and I prophesied and I did all these things in your name. But Jesus would say, get away, I never knew you. You know why that verse is scary? You know why that verse like, kind of makes sense? Because obviously the people who prophesy in your name, don't they know you? No, they knew all who they knew of Jesus, but they never knew Jesus. Do you understand what eternal life is saying? It's, it's not just a knowledge where you're just as good as the demon. You're scared of God because you know he's real, or you know he exists. Or you're just like everybody who goes on, on the Grammy Awards and say, you know, I, I believe in God, I thank God. What God are you talking about? Do you just know God? And how is the way that you live? Do you just know facts about God? Do you just show up on a Sunday and read the Bible? You remember Bible verses? You could memorize the whole scripture and still go to hell. Can you believe that? You know, Satan knows the scripture and he's in hell. And so this is what it's calling. It's not just knowledge that you know facts, but it's a knowledge experience and then there's a lot of mystery between what does it mean to know God don't get me wrong there's a lot of mystery of how it really is how does it feel what does it taste like what does it feel like to know God it's a big mystery that the, the, that the humans that we would never know until we really get into heaven but there are some clues throughout the Bible that show us a little bit more about what does it means to know God and I want to get in there today because look, look at what verse 3 says. And this is eternal life. Jesus gave us eternal life. That's the main point of his works. Give us eternal life. And what is eternal life? That they may know you. The only true God is Jesus Christ who you've saved. God, that they may know God. Experience God. But that word knowing, we should look at where else in the Bible that comes from. So let's go to, uh, if you go in your Bible, I have to put this up, but if you go in your Bible, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. This is what we do. This is what you call scripture interprets scripture, which is the very theological term is cross-referencing. So when you open up your Bible and you read scripture, the first thing you want to do to really figure out the meaning is you want to go to other scripture to see what the scripture say about this scripture. And that's how we interpret the Bible. We look at different scriptures to see how the words you know, interplay, how did Paul say it there, how did Peter say it there. That, that's what we do in scripture. Okay, so look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. We have this word no. But it's in the Hebrew. The Hebrew word to know is yada, which is to know. It's just generally know. And it says this. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. So it says this. Adam and Eve, in their marriage, okay, you're going to follow me with me. Adam and Eve, in their marriage, there's this covenant love. There's this intimacy between a husband and a wife that Adam and Eve. And that word between them, the height of that intimacy is knowledge. So there is this instance between a husband and a wife that shows a little bit of what God is calling us to have in terms of knowing him. Adam knew the love and the joy of intimacy between a husband and a wife is an illustration of how God wants to be with his people. And if you don't believe me, go to Hosea chapter 2, verse 19, verse 20. And it says this. If, if you can go there, please go there. This is you know, you want. You can highlight the verse 2. It's crazy. It's crazy. So Hosea is basically when God brings a prophet, the prophet comes in. And uh, God commands this prophet to go marry a prostitute who which was on the street and was begging for money. And he's like, at the she's at the consequence of her sin. And, and he says, go ahead and go marry her and bring her. And, and marry her doesn't mean just, oh, go ahead and like, you know, have fun and marry her. It means go ahead and go take her in, care for her, provide for her a home, bring her up, be clean for her, change her life. 
that's what marriage means here to Hosea. And so it's an illustration of how God relates to his people. So look at this. Look at these words. Hosea chapter 2, verse 9 through 20. This is God speaking to Hosea to speak towards his people. Hosea, speak my word to my people. Hosea says this. Towards his people, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. There we go again. You shall know the Lord. You should know the Lord. In what way? In this way. The way that God said, this way. I will betroth you to me. Okay, now here's. Betrothed means to marry. That's what it is. I will marry you, Israel. I will betroth you to me forever. This is the thinking here. It's like God is a husband and Israel is his wife. And that's, that's the whole point of, of Hosea is to show that God is a husband, a loving, faithful husband to a wife who continues to sin against him through very unloyal. And it's a conflict between Israel's unfaithfulness and God's faithfulness. Who will win? And so Hosea chapter 2, verse 19 to 20, God concludes with this. I will marry you to me forever, Israel. Don't just think of it as just that's for Old Testament. That's the God of the Old Testament. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is God's plan for us as his people, as the church of God who is taking over the stuff is Israel. God says to us, I will betroth you to me forever. I will marry you. So it's, it, this is the picture. A husband and a wife love each other a lot. And on the wedding day, you think about a wedding day. I don't know, you've never been married. Maybe you've been married. Maybe you are married. Amen. Um, a husband and a wife. And they're going to do their vows, right? They're going to do their vows. When you think about that moment, it's probably one of the most special moments in your life, one of the most famous moments of your life. But picture yourself as the wife in this situation. As a husband, and you're gonna marry, you're gonna, you're gonna stop living under your parents, you're gonna start to live under his protection and everything like that. And this is what's happening. This is like what God is doing. He grabs the hand of you and his people. He says, I will marry you. He says, I will betroth you to me forever. This is like his vows to you. I will marry you to me forever. Oh, make a covenant with you. I love you so much. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice. You are my people, Israel. You are my people, church. I will betroth you. I will marry you forever. I will marry you in righteousness and justice. I will make you clean and hold you just for me because I love you. And you are mine. I will betroth you. I will make a commitment to you. I will betroth you in righteousness. I will betroth loving kindness and mercy. No matter how far you go away from me, I will be merciful to you. I will be always waiting at the door for you. I love you that much. I'm willing to make a commitment towards you. I'm willing to be faithful to you when you are faithless. I will still be faithful to you. God is like the husband and we're like the wife. And we continue to fail, fail, fail. We continue to worship other gods in our lives. We continue to do things and God takes the risk of marrying us. God takes that risk. It's like unheard of. This is the image that it's trying to show. It's crazy to think this, that marriage, the reason why you get married is that you know more about God. Marriage is a parable of how God is. It's an illustration of how God is to his people. So if you never get married in this world, you're missing out on an appetizer. When you go to heaven, you'll get the full meal. That's what, that, that's what marriage is all about. It's to give you a taste of who God is, an illustration of who God is. God is vowing towards us. He's making a covenant and commitment towards us. And, and there are a few things about marriage that explain the knowledge of God. How does marriage show the knowledge of God? There's a few things. You remember that verse that says one will be the two will become flesh, the two, um, the two flesh will become one flesh. So look at first Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. To know God is to unify him. Just like a marriage, 
in the unified world. So shall be done on earth. So it's all about the unified world. So look at this. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot, that's a prostitute, joined to a prostitute is what body with him? He's saying, don't Christian, the Corinthians, don't go out and live sexual immoral lives, because that's that's not from God. What you're doing is you're taking your body and you're conforming it to someone else. But we're gonna look at read in the next verse that you can't do that, Christians, because you're already conformed to someone, whether you're single or not single, you're already conformed and joined to someone. Verse 17, or verse, verse 16, join. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For the two he says shall become one flesh. Verse 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. You know, some, some of the, there's a, I had a debate with a Mormon person. It's not a Mormon thing. And one of the big things about them is that. They think that marriage will last forever, like eternity. And one of the things I told them was that marriage can't last forever, it only lasts till you die, because flesh doesn't last forever. And when you start to understand the implications of how marriage illustrates God, you start to realize that flesh will decay, but spirit will last forever, and if flesh will meant to stay together in this world, it will last only for this world, but it's to show you the greater and the greater, the great mess of enjoying the full course meal. If flesh together is very pleasurable, very nice, very joyful, very loving, and very enduring, romance between two people is like one of the best things you can enjoy on the earth. What does it mean to be joined with one spirit to the world? You know what I'm saying? To know God in, in, in the sense of how a husband knows their wife and the intimacy between them is such a great thing in this world. And so imagine how greater it is to know God in one spirit. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Is one spirit with him. There is so much mystery to what that means. But it means one thing, that just like a husband and wife, the intimacy between them, that they know each other, they love each other, they know each other, they're unified to each other. My identity is in my marriage, my identity is in the other person. We become one. That's, the, that's how we're supposed to be with God. That we would be his people, he would be our God. That we would submit and commit and, 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 and come under him. That we unify our identity in him. We start to look like him more. We start to live in holiness and righteousness. There were people looking at us and they said, Oh, you look like your father in heaven. You look like your husband. You look like the one that you're conjoined to. There were people looking at you and they're like, No, that cannot just come from you alone. It has to come from something else. And that something else is my husband in heaven. My father in heaven. My one that who's created me, my creator, my king in heaven, my master in heaven, my Adam. To know God is to unify with Him. Where our resources become something, where our strength is not because we are strong in ourselves, but because God is strong. Where our knowledge is not because we're smart and wise of ourselves, but because God is wise. And he transposes his information into our minds so that we carry out the wisdom of God because God gives us wisdom. Then we're strong and powerful because the Lord has grace and his grace flows through us to do his work in his will so that people go wild. Their power will not be from yourself, but someone that is above you and that is God. God becomes our resource and our source of strength. And our source of enthusiasm, enthusiasm and energy. When you're lost and weak and tired with that energy, you just give up because you can't follow the Lord's will because you don't have enough. It's a lie from the pit of hell to believe that you don't have enough to follow the walk of Christ because you were never meant to trust in your own resources, but meant to unify yourself with the one who is perfect in all his nature, the one who is strong in all his power, the one who is knowledgeable of all his knowledge and knows and understands all things in which humans can never understand. The infinite God is one that we unify ourselves to become under him. To unify is to know God. To know God is to unify yourself like a marriage.
slave to the wife who submits under her husband, like a slave who submits under the master, like a king who submits under the master, the father, to unify and become one with him. And the implications of marriage, just like a marriage, to know is to love God, to know the love of God. That's what a marriage is, but right? when you begin to know your spouse, you love your spouse. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. And I wish I knew this when I was young. But do you know what romance is for? It's the pen picture of how God loves his church. Let, let, let that blow your mind. Let that blow your mind. You know, my generation today, they're looking around for, you know, bathing and having fun and all that kind of thing and romance this and the whole this romantic this and blah, blah, blah. You're missing the connection between why romance was created. It was created to pick a picture of how God is greater and how God loves his church. That's why the Bible is filled with Old Testament love language. Some of you, the reason why some of Solomon is made, so that they can paint a picture of how Christ loves his bride, the church. These are amazing things. If you if you live a life, that's what Paul says, no, if you live a life of celibacy, you won't miss out. It's good to be single. Oh, nowadays, everyone's like, you know, why are you not married? Why are you not this? Why are you not that? And I, used to, I remember I used to preach a preach too, but no, 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 Christian no, 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 the point of your marriage is to live out the love of God that has for your life. You're not missing out if you don't get married. Even if you're married, you're still going to find your soulmate. Your soulmate is not the one you're married to. I'm talking about a soulmate, the perfect one. Everybody in there, when they're little kids, they have a picture of that one person that will save their life, that one person that will, that will be perfect for them, and their life will change. I'm telling you, please hear me, church. Christ is the perfect for your life. He's Mr. Ryder and Mrs. Ryder. He's the one. He's the one. And you're not married. It's not over. It's not over. You're just missing out on the appetizer. So that when you die, you get the full meal. Romance is just an illustration. It's just a taste. Young people of the church, let me write one row. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Let the Lord show you before you look for a partner or anything like that. Amen. Seek the Lord in that way. Let the Lord fulfill you. Amen. God can fulfill you so much that you can be like Paul. You, your whole life is not revolved around looking for a man. It's not what you're called to, you're called to do more. You're called to love the Lord and understand what does it mean to love Him. That's your goal, that's your purpose, that's, your, that's the height of, of what you are. That's, that's everything. That's the point of the Bible. So to know God is to love God, to understand the joy of intimacy between God. To understand his deep love. When we go there, uh, he me hundred fourteen, I just realized that it's it's an explanation about God's love as deep as the ocean. God's love, deep as the ocean. Like a husband to his wife. I love you, I love you, I love you. In some cases, a man like me, and look what a man you should do, would never know. What does it mean to be a wife towards a husband? So sometimes the illustration goes out. But we do know one thing. We know how how great marriage is. And if we know how great marriage is, then we know how great God is. Because marriage is a real, it's just an illustration. It's a really good illustration. It's an illustration of Christ. But to know God is to love God and to understand his deep love for us, his affection for us, his compassion. Could you imagine anybody who would die on the cross for you? 
Not even a wife. You know, maybe someone doesn't know someone who has someone with a wife or a lot of cross. But an excruciating cross. What a cross, you know, where people die, like nails driven in their hands. Why? Jesus, why are you dying, Jesus? Jesus, why are you dying? Because I love them. Maybe a, maybe a person who could do that in this world, who could endure the wrath of God for us. That's, that's the, the reason why the cross is so excruciating is not just because of the, because of the cross. There's a little bit more punishment that can be worse than the cross. But what makes the cross more excruciating, really painful, is that God, in a sense, Christ faced the wrath of God. And that's something to be scared of. That's something to be, to be um, concerned about. The wrath of God. Jesus endured the wrath of God. Why? Because he loved him. Because he loved him. God sent his son. Why? Who would send their son for their bride who is unloyal to him? Because he loved his son. So to know is to walk out. And just like a marriage, the last thing is to know is to commit towards God. To submit towards him. When I say that, this is the word. You know, I'm getting the ring, I'm working, I'm no longer looking for a spouse, looking for anybody else. This is the one I want to commit to. This is the one I want to give my life to. This is the one where I want to do my whole life with and, and do everything with. I'm no longer looking around. I'm, I'm, I'm dead center. I'm living my life with you. Just like that. To know God and to commit to Him. To be like, God, I'm no longer looking for any other God in this life. I no longer think about my identity. I no longer think about the ways that I live. I no longer think about what I want to do and what I want to be. I want to be just like you. I want to unify with you. I want to commit towards you. I'm no longer looking for other gods. I'm no longer looking for other things. I'm looking towards you, God. I'm looking towards you. I commit my life to you. You know when you say the salvation prayer? When you say the salvation prayer, don't, don't hold it just like a... Like can you imagine a wife coming towards the marriage and then when they come towards their vows, they just say the prayer, oh, oh God, no, I give my life to you. I surrender my life to you. I give you all my life. I want you to protect and provide for me. I want to do your will. Can you imagine saying that in your marriage vows? And then the next day, you're just like acting like it doesn't exist. What kind of marriage is that? It's like crazy. And yet the same way, sometimes we treat this salvation prayer like it's just a salvation prayer. Just, just that everybody knows that we did it and we go back to the same thing. I, I want you to see God like a, like a husband. Not just like a God who just, maybe to you, he's like a master. Like he's a slave master who teaches you what you do good and what you do wrong. And then judges your righteousness. And maybe that's, that's God towards you. That's how you know God. I don't want you to be like that. God, God doesn't stand up here and say, okay, you come to the church and you did this much for me. Okay, you're righteous to come to him. Oh, you didn't come to church this week? Oh, you, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. Oh, you're not speaking to your Bible church? Okay, you're not coming to him. Oh, not by works, but by faith you are saved. By grace you are saved, not by works that none can boast. You are righteous today, not because you did it, because Christ has died on the cross and rose again, and you believe in him for the day that you die. In that, Christ says, I love you, my son, because you have not turned away my son. Because you kissed the son, bless me. Let the rest of the world. Because you perish in your life. Because you have chosen Christ. Christ is not a master towards you, who's angry at you, who do right and wrong, who judges your righteousness and you go into heaven based upon whether you, whether you, you did enough today. God is a father, not, 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 a, not, a, not a boss. Don't look at God like a boss. He's not just a friend, right? He's, he's not just someone who just, you know, a good friend who just sits there and says, okay, you know, or, you know, do better, you know, like, he's not, he's not just someone on the outside who advises your life, he's not just a teacher, right, he's not just someone that just teaches you good things, and if you receive it, then you receive it, if you don't, it's fine, because it's just teaching, he's not just a professor, 
if in college you get your good theology and you learn from God, that's good. He's not just a preacher or a prophet. That's, that's the Muslim faith. They think he's a prophet, just a good man and a good prophet. He's not just that.